Welcome back to the series on censored conversations, promoting open and critical discussion about COVID-19 and its consequences. My name is Romina Estrati, and I'm currently research associate to the Department of Development Studies at SOAS, University of London. And I also serve as the Global Challenges Research Fund Officer for SOAS. Uh, Monica Hirmer and I co-founded Decolonial Subversions, uh, which is an open access multilingual publishing platform. And it is dedicated to subverting the dominance of Western epistemology in, in scholarship but also in bridging uh, social issues and public concerns with research and uh, science. Uh, and this current YouTube uh, channel, but also the current series, uh, precisely reflects our commitment to bringing these two realms together more effectively. So since the outbreak of COVID-19, uh, we have observed what could be described as a deterioration of healthy dialogue around the pandemic, uh, around, you know, in both understanding the science uh, uh, behind SARS-CoV-2, uh, but also uh, in deciding responses to it. Um, this lack of dialogue seems to have been combined with some other worrisome trends that we have observed uh, in our parts of the world, but I think more globally, uh, which is, uh, you know, perhaps a, a reduced accountability in, in government responses, um, some convergence, some, some worrisome convergences between capitalist, epistemic, and uh, bureaucratic interests, the encroachment of high techs in public health data collection, and various other trends that uh, are important to, to critically look at. Uh, but uh, also it has, it has made visible some existing socioeconomic inequalities and how these inequalities then have different implications in terms of health for different groups. Um, so what we, we set up this series essentially to, to reflect on these issues, on these questions, which are the more social, scientific, philosophical, ethical questions around the pandemic and, its response, and the responses to it that we think haven't been systematically explored in the more epidemiological and public health conversations. And we hope to do this by uh, inviting uh, you know, specialized uh, thinkers and practitioners from across the world uh, to explore a, a, a specific topic each time. Uh, so in this series, uh, we are, we are in, in, today we are continuing this series uh, with a discussion on some of the underlying lessons and implications uh, of COVID-19 for international collaborations, uh, international collaboration in addressing public health crises, uh, but also in, um, uh, to explore future directions, uh, perhaps in promoting a more reciprocal or two-way knowledge exchange between Western societies or high-income societies and low- and middle-income societies, or what oftentimes we refer to as Southern and Northern countries. Um, and to do so, we have invited today a very, uh, an excellent speaker, Dr. Ithiani mcwilliams Nusufor, uh, who is the CEO of EpiAfric um, and Director of Policy and Advocacy at Nigeria Health Watch, based in Nigeria. He's also a Senior New Voices Fellow at the Aspen Institute in Washington, D.C., and a Senior Atlantic Fellow for Health Equity at George Washington University. Ifiani has advocated extensively for universal health care, equity in health education, uh, the need to address health misinformation, and other relevant topics, and he's truly a distinguished thought leader in global health. Uh, so it is a pleasure to, to have Ifiani today with us. Ifiani, welcome, and thank you for joining us. Yeah, thank you so much, Romina. Thank you for having me. It's, um, I, I consider it as an honor to be part of this, to, you know, to share ideas from Abuja, Nigeria. Thank you so much. We are, as I was telling you just before we start our conversation, we truly are keen to have more speakers who are based in, in the so-called Global South and, and who, who, you know, do not, um, who have the experience on the ground and understand the realities and, and can, can give us a better sense of what is going on. Uh, and, you know, really, uh, uh, receive, have this decentralized conversation that we hope for and aspire to. So thank you for joining us, Ifiani. I hope everyone is keeping well and healthy in your community. Uh, yeah, 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 we're, we're, we're doing well. Um, yeah, I'm trying to battle COVID-19, but yes. yeah, I, think, uh, I think we're doing well so far. And we're going to get to that in today's conversation to see Nigeria's response so far. Um, I watched your presentation, obviously, uh, in, uh, in the context of the SOAS Oxford uh, Research for Development webinar series that my colleague Maru and I are coordinating. Mm -hmm. And uh, I, I, I really valued your contributions, especially your emphasis on uh, the fact that disease diseases do not respect borders, right? And the need for substantive collaboration between Western and African societies in this case, uh, that really departs from the usual narrative you know, that expertise lies with the West or with the high income societies uh, and, you know, uh, truly leveraging on the accumulated knowledge and experience that African countries have in dealing with pandemics, you know, different diseases and other pu public health crises. 
Um, and, and I really want us to focus on that. I think, I think that was a really important um, point that you made. Yeah. Um, you have written quite extensively uh, from essays I've read on the lessons that other countries, such as the US, could learn from Nigeria's response to the pandemic. Uh, would you like to summarize some of these lessons and, and tell us uh, your thoughts of why you think these lessons haven't been heard fully or really engaged with on the other side? Okay, so thank you again, Romina, for having me. Um, I, I think for me, the first lesson is that, um, that I think uh, countries from the global north should learn from the global south is that experience really when it comes to uh, detection, prevention, and responding to infectious disease outbreak is the, is the best teacher in mm -hmm. a way because one, it helps you set up structures. Uh, it helps you know the right things to do. And I think it also helps you most importantly to have a high index of suspicion so that you don't, you don't take things for granted. You know, when you hear that there's a particular outbreak uh, happening within your own uh, location. So for instance, um, the African region, the Sub-Saharan Africa is currently dealing with more than a hundred infectious disease outbreaks, including COVID-19. Mm -hmm. And I think that in all the discussions about uh, how different countries are responding to COVID-19, uh, the global community tends to forget that. We're dealing with all that, and yet we're also, you know, doing so well in managing um, COVID-19. So I think that's one. The experience that we've had uh, made us much more prepared because we set up structures. So, uh, and the question is, what kind of structures did we set up that, you know, made us better prepared? Yeah. So I, I think uh, one of those structures is um, setting up uh, public health uh, emergency operation centers in different, especially at the subnational levels. Mm -hmm. Because what this means is that it's a structure that helps governments at the subnational levels know exactly who is the incident manager. So if we have an infectious disease outbreak, who is in charge? Mm -hmm. And because of that, you know, they will set up funds and set up other processes to help with the detection, prevention, and, and, and respond to those diseases. And one other thing I think uh, the Global North uh, can learn from the Global South and Africa in this case in particular is the ability of the African Union through the Africa Center for Disease Control to coordinate the response efforts you know, for COVID-19 and other infections across the continent. And we learned that, the African Union learned that you know, after the Ebola outbreak in West Africa in 2014 you know, slash 2015, and incidentally our firm, AP Africa, evaluated the African Union's response to that particular outbreak. So after that outbreak, it was clear to the African Union that they needed to set up a center for disease control to be able to you know, respond to emergencies when they happen. So having a regional body that coordinates efforts of different countries within a particular uh, continent, I think it's a good lesson that other countries have to learn. And, and I, I think, again, you know, what uh, several African countries have done well is uh, um, showing uh, you know, very strong political will. We've mm -hmm. seen that presidents of different countries have empowered their national public health institutes, you mm -hmm. know, to be the ones making decisions and advising the government on what to do. Uh, so, for instance, in Nigeria, for example, uh, mm -hmm. the Nigeria Center for Disease Control is our national public health institute. And they are, they are the ones that everybody rallies towards to advise on what to do and also to provide, you know, to provide guidance to different agencies, you know, uh, responding to the outbreak. Uh, the fourth lesson I want to mention here is that we've also tried to incorporate the private sector in this response. This is something Nigeria has done well too, because mm -hmm. before COVID-19, for instance, in Nigeria, we had just four reference labs, you know, that had the capacity to diagnose COVID-19. Mm -hmm. But as we speak, we have about 32, 33 labs spread across the country. Seven of them are private labs. This had never happened before. Mm -hmm. uh, and, you know, again, coordinated and led by the Nigeria Center for Disease Control. And I think my last response to this question is, again, that political will that African leaders showed by closing that borders as quickly as possible. On yeah. the continent, Rwanda led that particular effort, closed down the, you know, closed down borders to make, because it was clear to us that this was an infectious disease that was being transmitted you know, by people traveling from one, part, from one part of the country to the other. Mm -hmm. So once it happened, once we came to that realization, uh, different African governments took that decision to lock down the borders to ensure that at least, you know, uh, let's now focus on dealing with the cases that we had and most importantly, also checking if there are community transmissions so that we, we begin mm -hmm. to mount uh, the appropriate responses to them.
I, and this is a very comprehensive answer. And thank you so much for uh, really thinking through, you know, the key points and, and help us understand, you know, uh, what the contributing factors might have been. And, and actually, you know, we have observed from, from here, from a distance, uh, quite, you know, these prompt responses across Africa. Again, as you said, stopping international travel, uh, communicate, governments communicating timely the scientific information to the publics to ensure that there's no misinformation or misinterpretation of the data. And, and you know, uh, putting forth plans or setting up labs in order to build the evidence because each country might have different questions and issues and you know, the, the evidence needs to, to take a context specific approach, the evidence building process. And I'm thinking also of Ethiopia and Senegal have been, you know, two cases that I'm dealing with personally and, and very sci science driven. And as you say, uh, very prompt responses. And, and it seems, again, it seems to me that uh, countries have learned from previous experiences, uh, which, you know, I guess, uh, having the African Union as a regional body, you know, this Pan-African platform ha might have helped to that. And, and I wanted us to sort of explore that a bit because obviously, as you say, it's not enough for ind individual countries to respond quickly, but also to act regionally and collectively. And I'm just wondering, uh, you know, I'm aware that the African Union, um, there is the African Union uh, Disease Control Center that you mentioned, but also there is this, the fund that was set up since to collect funds and, and help individual countries that respond to the pandemic in the region. Has this body been uh, crucial in these responses? I mean, why is it, is it important to, to take this regional approach? Yes, absolutely. It is because, um, um, so like I said, you know, during the SOAS Oxford lecture that mm -hmm. infectious diseases do not respond, they don't respect borders. And really, even the so-called borders that we have in Africa were set up by the, you know, by the colonialists, you know, to, mm -hmm. you know, to break down those boundaries. So we know that they are very fluid. When you get, so for example, in Nigeria, if you get the whole of the eastern part of Nigeria, northeast and southeast, is bordered by Cameroon from the yeah. bottom to the top. Uh, you know, on the northern part is Chad Republic and Niger, then, you know, Benin Republic on the west. So those borders essentially are just, as far as we're concerned, just, you know, land crossings that yeah. people who live around, around those borders uh, can easily uh, cross from one country to the other. Mm -hmm. So having uh, a continental approach is very, very important. Um, and of course, in terms of funding by the African Union, um, I think after, you know, 20... 16, 2017, you know, with, with uh, the Kigali financing mechanism that was led by mm -hmm. the then, you know, African Union chairman, uh, um, His Excellency Paul Kagani. Uh, mm -hmm. Because what he now did was, how do we begin to exit from over-dependence on donors yeah. uh, on one hand? Because before then, about 73% of the budget of the African Union was funded by donors. Up yeah. to 60% was funded by the, by the European Union. And it didn't make any sense. Uh, this, which was part of the overdependence, but I'm happy that you know gradually we're beginning to move away from that to the extent that about 41% of our of what the African Union spends, you know, is being contributed by by, by different countries. Because mm -hmm. when you do that, when you're able to fund your own interventions, then you you have you're able to make decisions on what it is that you feel are priorities on the continent. Okay. Um, yeah, so I think that was a, that that's a very huge lesson and. One other thing I think that uh, the African Union has able, been able to do uh, and a major lesson from the COVID-19 is uh, at a point in time, it was even very difficult for different African countries to buy, you know, commodities, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Uh, you know, personal protective equipment in the international market. Yeah. So what did the African Union do? Pulled resources again, set up a platform, you know, to, to be able to uh, uh, um, consider Africa as a block, you know, in procuring some of those things. Because what that means is that you have a stronger bargaining power, uh, mm -hmm. you're able to get it cheaper. And again, uh, the African Union is able to uh, coordinate better. Granted, some part of that is still funded by donors, but the bulk of it is not. Uh, yeah. And the fact that it's an initiative that was, you know, um, arrived at by, you know, by, the, by the union, led by different eminent persons from the continent. So funding, being able to fund interventions or most of all the interventions by the African Union, definitely it's, I think it's a game changer. And yeah. for me, as somebody who has always said or believed that we have all the resources that we need within the continent, mm -hmm. what we need to do is to think a bit more creatively about how do we channel resources? How do we, you know, mm -hmm. and of course, how do we deal with issues around governance, issues around corruption and stuff like that, so that we have 
more resources to be able to, you know, to do these things for ourselves. Uh, yes. So definitely, the African Union leading at the continental level has, you know, has really uh, improved our response and also ensured some level of accountability and, you know, yeah, uh, yeah in, in, in this intervention. And, and I think this, I mean, this is absolutely important and encouraging to, to see that people think about uh, the implications of these funding asymmetries. Uh, and yes, you know, the, the colonial legacies of international development in general, public health, humanitarian aid is well known. And there are people who have tried to change the narrative and, and change, uh, you, you know, the way we even think about development. But it has been very difficult because of the structural and material inequalities. Funding keeps being granted primarily by western institutions western organizations western donors and obviously uh, having i have worked in a, as a research funding officer and i currently work with funding bodies here in the uk to apply decolonial lens to funding structures and eligibility criteria in order to um, raise more awareness about the implications of these asymmetries for knowledge production and and it you know it's evident that uh, the funder has an influence in setting the agenda and that agenda will then influence how the project is set up, who is who the collaborators are or can be based on the guidelines of the of the call, and and what objectives it will aim towards, how it will conceptualize impact, which might you know be very different than how impact is understood by local communities and local stakeholders. Uh, and I also had the privilege of working for a global health consultancy previously, and I remember uh, we looked at the influence of the Bill and, and Melinda Gates Foundation in public health, which is very pertinent to our discussion. And I remember uh, looking at statistics from 2000 to 2013 in the context of a project led by um, Francesca Boldrini at the LSE. And uh, if the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation were to be a country, it would probably be third in the ranking of all the uh, public health expenditure on average annually between that, that period that I looked at, uh, which was, I think, uh, a cumulative, uh, it was 45% of the cumulative proportion annually on average for that period. That is insane to me because, you know, that means that a data foundation, uh, you know, it might have uh, priorities that other people resonate with, but still it is a single foundation setting the agenda to a large extent. And uh, there has been a lot of reporting on, on how the polio campaign that was led by the foundation could have uh, drawn attention from other priorities locally. Uh, in the Gavi Alliance, you know, there's a lot of commotion around the Gavi Alliance, which the foundation is involved with uh, because of associations with population control. So these things can raise controversies and tensions locally. You know, we all know that. Um, so I really think the funding is a key issue, a crucial issue. And I'm glad that you're saying, you know, that African leaders, uh, people like yourself are thinking about that and, and how we overcome them. So I thought, you know, what can what is the way forward then you know thinking of this unequal landscape is it an issue of african thinkers and practitioners infiltrating these foundations and changing the agenda or is it really about entirely overcoming this dependency and working with original funding bodies you know we have the, the academy of african sciences for instance when it comes to scientific research uh, and other regional bodies now, such as the fund that the African Union has set up to respond to COVID-19. You know, what are what other uh, alternatives do you see, Vianney? Okay, so first of all, um, um, so nature abhors a vacuum. Mm -hmm. uh, there's a vacuum, there's a huge need. Somebody has to fill that vacuum. And I think because of that, we're grateful to, you know, the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation and so many other foundations that have stepped in to fill the gaps while you know african leaders you know kind of slumbered um but again we know that needs are infinite resources are limited even the foundation has limited resources there is an extent to which uh they can fund things uh they may be interested in other things based on you know their own funding priorities uh, yeah. but ultimately we're talking about a people you know 1.2 billion people in in africa for instance that uh, our governments must begin to think about innovative ways of doing, you know, funding some of these things. Mm -hmm. So for me, I really cannot understand why we still depend on Gavi to fund the immunization on the continent, because I think it's one of those very basic things we should be able to do for ourselves. But again, should we allow children to have vaccine preventable diseases because we have bad leaders? No. So mm -hmm. Gavi steps in. Uh, but I think answering this particular question, I need to draw from, you know, a lesson from Nigeria, because mm -hmm. if you look at total health expenditure in Nigeria, the last time it was estimated in 2018, um, was about $10 billion per year. Mm -hmm. Now, $7.7 .7 billion out of that amount was out of pocket. Mm -hmm. 
So people were going to spend, you know, mainly in chemists or community pharmacies in order to pay for healthcare. 1.1 billion of that amount was donor support. Mm. So that if you look at it, if you just look at that data, what it tells you is that out-of-pocket expenditure is seven times the amount that we get from donors. Yeah. So in reality, to me, that tells me that we really don't need donor support to fund healthcare in mm. Nigeria. What we need to think creatively about is how do we look at this donor support, this out-of-pocket expenditure that people are already spending, mm -hmm. but they are spending in places where they don't get quality health care, and how do we channel that into health insurance so that we have a publicly, you know, led, you know, a health insurance system that would cover everybody. So mm -hmm. this is something that I feel that people in leadership positions have not thought through or have not, you know, decided to, to show the required political will to do that. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So, and apart from that, there are also other philanthropists on the continent, very few yeah. for that matter. So in Nigeria, we, the largest philanthropic foundation in Africa is the Langote Foundation. Mm -hmm. That's, uh, you know, yes, Aliko, that's the in Nigeria. Uh, the, the, the foundation started with an endowment of about $1 billion, which is mm -hmm. huge. Yeah. Even in Nigeria, the T. Wadanjuma Foundation mm -hmm. uh, in 2010, which was the first indigenous structured foundation in Nigeria, started with an endowment of $100 million as far back as then. So what we're saying is that apart from government taking leadership, you know, to improve governance and to ensure that funds are properly channeled, how do we also grow or encourage local philanthropists mm -hmm. to begin to invest in the health sector and the social care system so that some of this dependence that we have on foreign donors will begin to cease? Because like you said, by the time we're able to fund these things ourselves, then we'll begin to decide what we think mm -hmm. our priorities and the best way, you know, we think we're going, to, we're, going to, we're going to achieve this. So for me, everything really boils down to leadership, to be honest. Uh, because again, if you, if you, if you, even if you look at the WHO um, uh, framework, six frameworks mm -hmm. of, of the health system, uh, the, most, the, most, the most important is governance and leadership. So as long as African governments, African leaders are not stepping in to do what they are supposed to do, then donors, you know, would have to fill the gap uh, because mm -hmm. we, can't, we can't watch our people die. But ultimately, it's just for African leaders and people in authority in Africa to realize that we have the resources within. When I think about the Democratic Republic of the Congo, for instance, and mm -hmm. all minerals that are, you know, that are stolen, you know, that, you know, children, even the way they are currently mined, is not safe, it's not being done ethically. Children are pushed to do all sorts of labor, and yet, DRC that is rich in minerals is one of the poorest countries in the world, has some of the worst health indices. So we really need to sit up as, as, you know, as Africans. If we're saying that we want the global not to give up power, mm -hmm. we, must be, we must be ready to take up power. To claim up, it. Yeah, to yes. claim it and take up responsibility. <laughs> I, I think <laughs> yeah. this is a brilliant point, if you're sorry to interrupt you. I was uh, getting excited because I think uh, it's a brilliant point. I don't think that someone who has power will willingly give it up. I mean, I'm working on, I'm working on decolonizing international development for the past decade. And, uh, you know, very few people will, will get out of their comfort zone to, to go into the rural communities. I, I'm, I'm an anthropologist, so I work with rural communities. And, you know, I've been to communities who haven't seen anyone coming. And, uh, you know, because it's out of people's comfort zone, because they can achieve the same things by doing much less. And that is power to some extent, right? Uh, and it's the same with, with the funding landscape and the donor landscape. You know, it's an open market at the end of the day is what you're saying. So, you know, they will jump in if there is an opportunity because yes, it is philanthropy. There are always good intentions. International development has been based on, in, on good intentions. The civilizing mission of uh, colonialism, of, of the missionary uh, missionaries that arrived to Africa was also based on good intentions, but it had multiple ne negative effects and consequences. So good intentions are not enough. And I think we, we all are at a point where we, we understand that. Uh, the, the question, I, I think what you're really getting at is, 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 is brilliant because you're telling that, that you know, it's, it all lies with the agency on the other side as well, to, to a large yeah. extent, to, to be resourceful, to be creative, uh, to think of uh, ways to um, uh, to become more dominant in the market, uh, in in public health debates, uh, in public health funding, and I think working with philanthropists is an excellent point. Monica and I have been uh, really, uh, you know, I've, I work in Ethiopia and I've come across 
uh, wealthy business people who are very interested in the research I do in the rural communities. And they say, you know, if you, if you need support, if you need funding, uh, I'd love to help this kind of research. And Monica and I have had this, she works in India. And we've noticed that the private sector is very interested in supporting research that is for the benefit of communities and research that is marginalized, uh, you know, on the culture or the languages or the history of the communities. And, and I, you know, Monica and I really want to leverage on the private sector in supporting decolonial subversions as one platform to produce, global, you know, internationally knowledge that is multilingual. Uh, but also, you know, it gives me this good idea that it, it, it relates to what you're saying, that actually the private sector can be resourceful in, you know, in general to address, you know, de development issues of, of public health issues. Um, how, how, how aware is the business sector or the private sector about these uh, 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 opportunities, I guess, that lie ahead? Okay. Uh, no, I, I think um, one thing that COVID-19 has shown is that, uh, and again, I'm, I'm quoting the, you know, my TEDx talk in 2018, is that without health, we have nothing. Mm -hmm. That is very clear. It's affected everybody. It's affected businesses, short than economies. Nobody can do anything. So I think there's a heightened sense of awareness of the importance of you know, good health care and ensuring that that you know, is supported in different ways that you know, people can. Mm. So again, there, there's a great lesson from Nigeria because immediately we had, not long after we had our first index case, our index case of COVID-19, private businesses led by some banks and even a liquid Angote foundation mm. set up the private, you know, private sector coalition for COVID-19 you know, COVID mm -hmm. for short. And within the past three to four months, this private sector coalition has raised about 25 billion naira, which is about, um, which is, you know, probably about, let's say, you know, something about uh, maybe $70 million yeah. within, mm -hmm. within three months. And what they are doing, they're wow. using it to support the government's intervention. They are doing things like building isolation centers, supporting government with, say, uh, ventilators and stuff like that, you know, even using it to provide palliatives. Because mm -hmm. one thing that we've seen with COVID-19 is that I would never thought about initially if we were thinking about epidemic preparedness was that in pandemics, you have to prepare for palliatives because people will not do businesses. Small business owners will not go out and be able to do their businesses. So mm -hmm. even in providing such palliatives, the private sector coalition in Nigeria is leading this effort and supporting government you know, and providing funds, you know, and all sorts of uh, support to, to low-income families across the, across the country. So I think that, and I, and I hope that by the time COVID-19 ends, this is a lesson that the private sector will take away to, you know, begin to support other mm -hmm. aspects, you know, of, um, of the health sector. And even on the continent, again, um, the African Union through the Africa CDC set up a platform, you know, for, like I said initially, for procuring supplies. Mm -hmm. Uh, mm -hmm. That is being led by that is being led by a, a private sector person, uh, mm -hmm. you know, the Zimbabwean billionaire Stride Masiyiwa. He's the one mm -hmm. leading that. You know, even before that platform was set up, the, the private, the African Union had also set up, you know, a set of eminent persons. Three of them, mm -hmm. uh, Kaberuka, who was the former um, CEO of the African Development Bank, is part of that. Okonjo Ewala mm -hmm. from Nigeria is part of it. So mm -hmm. you see that even within the continent, we're beginning to see the possibilities that exist. But one thing that I like in what you said about, you know, your experience in Ethiopia of having the private sector fund your research is, let's also begin to help the private sector understand that supporting interventions is not a high polluting thing. Mm. You don't have to do a call for proposals. You don't have to set up one mighty structure in order to do that. So if, for instance, let's even use infectious diseases. If, for instance, you're a private business operating a local community and uh, you want to support interventions for infectious disease, you know, preparedness. Mm. You can support training of health workers. You can support, you know, providing sanitation and clean water in those facilities. You can mm. support even paying for health insurance, you know, for some of the poorest members in the community. Because I think that the private sector support is so important, but because the private sector people are business people, quite all right, but they are not health people, we need to be able to help them think through the, some innovative ways of supporting, you know, this particular. Mm -hmm. yeah. But in terms of the private sector stepping up on the African African continent for COVID nineteen, that has been quite exemplary. And I hope that, mm -hmm. you know, these are lessons that we can take forward to say, how do we now support healthcare generally? Mm 
yeah, yeah. Because personally, I believe that as long as so many countries in Africa do not have access to universal health coverage, mm -hmm. then the risk of all these things, you know, healthcare, you know, infections, you know, happening still exists. So mm -hmm. these are the, some of the ways I think we can support the private sector to begin to, you know, support healthcare delivery in general, yeah. you know, across so the country. To think more creatively, and I think when we say private sector, we mean not just uh, business per se, but uh, uh, innovative forms of business, social enterprising, which is, you know, an excellent way to combine social impact and, and, and re the resolution of social issues with business and uh, business creativity and enterprising, you know, enterprising objectives. Uh, and to just to clarify, I mean, in my in my research, you know, this is a thing. I I was receiving some fieldwork funding from from the usual funders. Uh, that, that fund research. Uh, and of course, I wouldn't think of accepting the offer that I received from the businessman that I met, uh, which was interesting because she came from entirely different community than the one I was working uh, with, entirely different religious tradition, different, you know, everything very different, but yet he, who could, he could understand the value of that research having interacted with me multiple times. Uh, and I did, you know, when I was considering this kind of offers, and, and then we had this discussion with Monica, uh, th a lot of people think that it's, um, you know, working with the private sector comes with risks that they can set the agenda that there's corruption, money laundering and all these issues. But, you know, these issues exist with the regular funders. I mean, the regular funders set the agenda. They might be more rigid in terms of corruption and due diligence. You know, they're very concerned about that. Uh, but, you know, the, the, this idea that a research is objective, research that is funded by a research funder is objective as opposed to research that is funded by the private sector or, or a philanthropist or a donor, I think is, is uh, unreasonable because it really depends on, on what kind of uh, agreement you have, right? Understanding what the expectations are. If you set the expectations, you know, if you're a government and you want to work with a private service in the uh, development of some equipment or training of staff, you set the expectations clear and you say exactly what role they have in that decision making and or you don't allow them to have that decision making uh you know make that clear that that's the case and then let them decide if they still want to fund that right yeah, yeah so absolutely. it's not it's not something that we can't work with yeah right? yeah i totally agree because i mean you're the person who is doing the implementation mm -hmm. you know what the ethical issues are you also know what you know what the country laws and regulations are Mm -hmm. uh, it's just ensuring that, you know, if you're going to support this intervention, these are the, you know, these are the rules that we play by. Yes, you know? yes. And, you know, again, it, it, just to explain a bit more about being innovative and, you know, uh, not complicating the issues if you want business mm -hmm. to support. Mm -hmm. So years back, for me, years back when I worked with uh, Nigeria's National Program on Immunization, I had gone to one of the states in the country and... Uh, they hadn't gone out for immunization for some time and i wanted to know why and they mm -hmm. said that well they didn't have ice packs to put in the cold boxes so that vaccinators oh. could go out you know but but when i thought of so it was a hard to reach area there was no national grid electricity hadn't gotten to that place at that point in time mm -hmm. but when i what i asked them was don't you have rich members of your community and i said no no they, they have i said okay can we go to one of them they said, took me to to the guy's house so, and I told the guy, so you have from morning till night and most, most times through the day, you have a generator that runs in your company. He said, yes. Mm -hmm. I said, okay, the way we want you to support immunization is give us a space where the local government health authority immunization office can bring a deep freezer. Just put mm -hmm. it out there and be putting in ice packs. They will come every day or on their immunization days weekly just to pick the ice packs put in the cool boxes so that, you know, the cold boxes so that the vaccinators can go. And it was, it was like, oh, no, why? Why? I mean, he said, I mean, that's something I'm happy to do. Mm -hmm. So, and, and even at that point in time, of course, I, 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 I didn't know what I know now, but I told the local government immunization officer that, you see, sometimes when you look for support, don't think about the big things. Mm -hmm. Because for that particular wealthy individual in the community agreed to that, what he has done in essence is that he has provided funding for cold chain in that particular community. It's as simple mm. as that. Mm. Because the vaccines are in the right temperature and children get the vaccines when they are supposed to get it. Mm. And that particular deficiency that they had in that local government, I hope that, you know, after I left and, you know, that, you know, they continued with it. So, mm -hmm. so those are the simple ways we can get businesses support. 
yeah. you know, because ultimately, yeah. what is the what is the end goal? What is the outcome we're looking at? And mm -hmm. in that particular example, we wanted children to be immunized. Mm -hmm. They had vaccines. They didn't have a coaching. Yeah. There was no national grid, but there was somebody who had generator in his house. He was mm -hmm. happy for them to put a freezer, and that was it. And we kind of bridged that gap. And if if I'm to document that process now, for me, that's an example of philanthropy. It's not, we shouldn't complicate it, you know, but again, if, if it mm -hmm. went beyond that and something that had to do with, um, you know, rights, you know, and ethical issues and, mm -hmm. you know, guidelines and all, we must insist that if you're going to support us in the way we're asking for, we must do it as the government yes. has related and we cannot break any laws. Yeah, precisely. Clear, clear expectations. I mean, every partnership, every collaboration has to really be play, uh, based on clear expectations. And then you decide whether you want to be involved in that, knowing the expectations. Uh, I think that's an important point. And, and I think you're also um, very effectively decolonizing the concept of philanthropy uh, currently, because uh, if philanthropy is, you know, we tend to think, oh, philanthropy is Western, because most of the donors have been Western and this, this hierarchy, asymmetry that exists in the landscape. But uh, but actually it doesn't have to be that way, right? And it, it hasn't been that way. A lot of people do philanthropical work in local communities in ways that are invisible to us. Yeah. Uh, and a lot of people have resources, not necessarily monetary, but other kinds of resources that could become part of, could be leveraged to address uh, community-wide issues and country-wide issues. Um, and, and, I, and I think what you're sort of pointing out to, uh, pointing to in, this, in, this, um, in your commentary is that it's important for communities and people themselves in, in these countries everywhere to understand their, the possibilities they have, right? Because a lot of people might not think of themselves as philanthropists. They might not think that they have the ability to really help or make a difference. So I think it's, it's important to um, have that communication and, and bring everyone together to realize that, you know, actually we can achieve something different together by contributing, you know, our respective comparative advantages or resources or, you know, ideas and so forth. Um, is this, is this, do you think that involving communities, you know, involving the publics, and I use the plural because there isn't a uniform public, um, yeah. to, to, to in engaging the publics to, to promote, you know, public health and, and, and the resolution of any development oriented res um, mm -hmm. problems in, in the community? Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I, t I totally agree with that. Um, because for me, as somebody who is also a social, uh, a social justice advocate, Mm -hmm. You cannot do anything for a community in spite of a community. You have to do it with them. You must, ex you must respect their cultures. You must respect their laws. You must respect how they do things. I mean, I mean just thinking back again, I just remembered. When, so my first foray into public health was working in the immunization sector in Nigeria. Mm -hmm. I worked in the immunization for about five years. And I remember this was in northern Nigeria, you know, the northeast part of the country. I had gone... I had gone for, again, to provide immunization activities. And mm -hmm. a day before we were supposed to start our particular intervention, we got re reports that uh, villagers were rejecting en masse. They didn't want to be immunized. You know, again, it was polio eradication. Mm -hmm. And so I told the um, local immunization manager, let's go and see the village head. So we went to see the village head. And after I spoke with him, because I grew up in the north, I can speak the local language, you know, Hausa. Mm -hmm. Uh, so after, I mean, he was actually impressed that somebody from the Eastern part could speak his language. So by the mm -hmm. time I finished speaking with him, he was happy, he said, okay, that he was going to send some of his chiefs to go out and talk to the villagers. Mm -hmm. So as we were about to leave, he said, no, we should hold on a bit that they were getting food for us to eat. Mm -hmm. So I told the, the local manager that, no, he shouldn't, but I said, no, I mean, you can't do that. That's, this is our culture. Yeah. So I sat down and they brought a tray of food you know, uh, with something like fufu with the soup in it. <laughs> and, and I turned to the local manager and said, no, I, please, can you tell the chief that I'm not interested? Now, what the local manager told me totally changed my perception about the rights and the cultures of communities. Mm. He told me that, so you want me to tell the chief that you, who is bringing polio vaccine for their children to take in their mouth, you cannot eat their food? That's what he told me. You know, that was kind of a, I felt so ashamed of myself for even thinking about it. So I had to wash my hands and all of us with his cheese, everybody in his palace, we all dug into the plate of food and ate. And mm -hmm. after I went out, he told me that, you know, you can't do that. It doesn't matter whether, whatever you thought about the food was irrelevant, but this was a way of showing the communities that, look, mm -hmm. we are one. Mm -hmm. 
yeah. we're bringing vaccines for you because we think you know that the, we know that the vaccines are good for your kids, your mm -hmm. children but also you know we respect your cultures we can dine and you know wine with you and and, and that's fine so and i think that this is something we probably don't see much of uh if you look at um uh, philanthropy as far as, you know, uh, the global north is concerned, because even before the intervention gets to the location, you had already make, made up your minds about what the activities yeah. are, what the outputs are, what the outcomes are. You're just coming to say, well, we're doing you a favor, you know, and coincidentally, I have also worked with the, the Grand Baking Foundation. Mm -hmm. And this was something that, you know, um, when we trained our grantees, we used to tell them, we wanted a plan that you had already discussed with, if not the community members, but the leaders. Yeah. You know, you need to involve them in the planning. You know, you need to involve them in the implementation. You also need to involve them in the monitoring and evaluation. People need to have a voice. Mm -hmm. you know, uh, and we cannot, we cannot be quarreling with the global north uh, because we think people in the global north have more voice. And yet, when we're implementing interventions in the communities, we don't allow people in the community to have a voice to say what it is they want and how they want it. And for me, this is this is this is the whole concept of social justice. You know, uh, how you want it to be meted out to you the same way you meted out to somebody who you're more privileged than you have more access to. And so, definitely involving communities and hearing their voices, what they want, how they want it to be done, and coming to you know some sort of agreement with them on on implementation is really the you know, the way forward in, in, in Absolutely. Development. And I'm, I'm so happy you, you articulated that. The reason I came into international development, because I wasn't interested, uh, I started uh, looking at agricultural system in the African region uh, when I was working for economists in the US as an undergraduate student with a scholarship. And I was seeing this scholarship uh, that simply uh, was no uh, narrating anywhere. It, it wasn't reporting anywhere. The voices of, of the actual farmers, the female and male farmers, you know, that they were speaking about and theorizing about. This is everything, you know, this really changed my life. And I, I, I you know, it sort of, I took a U-turn afterwards because I was so disappointed with how knowledge uh, production in, in northern countries was representing African countries and, and really pushed me to, to uh, sort of develop, well, try to develop something different, a different approach of community. So uh, one of the things, the first things I did is uh, to use a Socratic method in, I was working in Senegal in the Futa Torah with a, with a small Muslim community on, on agricultural livelihoods. And, and uh, I was in, you know, the mayor had invited me and we wanted to look at a culture sensitive approach to understand, you know, gender-related issues in the agricultural livelihoods. Uh, so my, you know, I, I thought, what, what best than have a dialogue with the community, you know, using the Socratic method of asking questions, uh, myself sharing my experiences, my knowledge of my society, uh, people in the local community sharing their own thoughts. And, you know, when you go into a community, there's all sorts of political tensions and socioeconomic tensions. But uh, what I found in that experience was how uh, quickly everyone came together then to resolve, uh, to answer the questions that we were asking, you know, what is development for us? What does it mean for our community? Uh, mm -hmm. How can we resolve agricultural, uh, you know, uh, issues of, you know, uh, soil, for instance, or, or land uh, degradation or whatever the question was or nutrition? And people, you know, put their creativity together and, and found ways. And it wasn't about me giving them a solution. I didn't have any. It was about facilitating that discussion, you know, and, um, and that was very beneficial for me as a learning experience, but also the community appreciated because they said, you know, this is something that we can do uh, in the future to come together and, and discuss issues. And, and it really, you know, brought home how little, uh, how rarely that happens in international development. And it has to do to a large extent with the lack of training in linguistic training of the of the multiple researchers or practitioners that arrived to these societies. Uh, you know, I've, I've spent a year in different African countries and I remember meeting people uh, coming across, you know, the UN cars and the, these multilateral, multilateral agency staff uh, and they just hang out in the same, you know, in the capital, in the same spaces. Mm -hmm. uh, Going into the, if you just travel 30 minutes outside, I, rem I remember I was in Rwanda in Kigali, and I, I traveled 30 minutes to the first rural community next to Kigali. There was uh, at the time no water or electricity for some reason. Uh, they would see what local life might look like for some people, but they were just sitting in the hotels in Kigali. And, and I really appreciate that you're saying that because we need to face it. Mm -hmm. it's, it's the reality. Yeah. Um, so, you know, making the effort, making the effort to be uh, locally grounded to learn the languages to the extent we can 
uh, will really appreciate the languages, you know, even learning some greeting, uh, sitting with the people and eating, uh, you know, sharing a drink, being culturally sensitive. Mm. Uh, I think is, is truly, people might not give it the importance it has, but it's, it makes a huge difference. Yeah. So thank you for sharing that story, Fiani. Yeah. I have, uh, on, on, this, uh, on the basis of this conversation, I have a, a big question for you, I guess, uh, as we approach near the end of this discussion. Yeah. You know, now th this discourse of decolonizing international development has become very salient, obviously. And, mm. um, you know, with, with this uh, heightened anti-racist racist sentiment now led by the Black uh, Lives Matter movement and the recent events, uh, obviously, there's more momentum to make some change happen or, or to see more substantive action, right? Not change, but action. Um, what do you think, you know, what is the, what should we be aiming for now moving forward in terms of public health crisis, working together collaboratively, uh, you know, in, in addressing shared problems and common issues and challenges in the world? So I, I think for me, the, the first thing is that um, we need to realize that uh, in as much as we want um, to decolonize global health, but we're, we're also not saying that countries should work in silos, you know, mm -hmm. not to share ideas, not to support each other when you, when you know that uh, that particular country needs, you know, the help. But what we're saying is that everybody concerned in this global health discussions must be at the table. And everybody being at the table also means that everybody must have a voice and you must, uh, for the global north that has the power, that has the resources, we need you to ask questions, you know, to say, okay, what is it you guys want and how do you want us to do it? How can we even support you to be truly independent? Because to be honest, it is not sustainable. And even for, for me, who is somebody from the global south, I realize the fact that there are also so many inequities, even in the global north, that they should be using the funds that they are, you know, sending to the global south to sort out. In the U.S., for example, lots of black, you know, black Americans, you know, still have very huge health inequities. They don't have health insurance. You know, maternal mortality is highest among the black community in the U.S. and stuff like that. So they, they need the funding for that. Uh, but we need to um, push for decolonization in such a way that there's mutual respect and understanding. And, you know, and really realizing that, look, um, and I like the way that Ms. Singh, you know, said it in that, in the Oxford uh, SOAS meeting that, you know, there are good heads everywhere. Mm -hmm. So the question is that how do we tap into all the good heads that we have to make sure that, you know, global health is, is advanced and the health of the people, are, you know, is, uh, is, 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 is protected. Mm -hmm. because, let, let's be honest about it. The U.S., for instance, has invested massively to improve mm -hmm. health on the African continent. Without the U.S. PEFA, for instance, yeah. So many people with HIV AIDS would have died on the African continent. And we're grateful for that, you know, mm -hmm. to be honest. But what we're saying is that it has gotten to the level where African governments must begin to say, okay, we're thankful for your support. Let's begin to take over some of these responsibilities. Mm -hmm. And even in taking them over, we obviously will need your support to set up structures. And for the US and all that donors that have invested heavily in Africa, why are you not tapping into the investments that you've made over the years to help mm -hmm. you with the challenges you're dealing with, with COVID-19, for instance. Because you've, the U.S. has invested heavily in epidemic through the U.S. CDC, in epi mm -hmm. epidemic preparedness. In fact, in Africa, there's this, um, you know, uh, training for disease epi epidemiologists that is funded by the U.S. CDC. And in the same structure that has helped us with contact tracing and stuff like that. So when are you going to tap into that? So the, 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 for me, the discussion around decolonizing global health is not we don't want to get no. It's, mm -hmm. let's do this thing in a respectful manner. Let's do it in such a way that we feel that our voices are being heard, but let's do it in partnership. Let's keep sharing ideas and let's keep advancing, advancing you know, equity in whatever form you know, that, you know, that, 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 that uh, we want to you know, look at equity. Mm -hmm. And also bearing in mind that in different countries, there are all sorts of, there are small pockets of you know, challenges that, you know, that we have to deal with. I remember after I was selected as a, an Atlantic fellow and we had our first convening in DC, one of our last meetings we had was a privilege walk. I had never, I had never participated in a privilege walk. By the time we ended the privilege walk, first of all, it was quite sobering for all of us mm. because what it showed us was that some of us from developing countries, from the global south, 
in reality, we are more privileged than some of the fellows, some of the black fellows from the US. You know, and that shows you why uh, we're not saying that decolonization is, you know, let, let, let everybody go their own way. We have to keep partnering and, you know, respecting each other and ensuring that um, every country, you know, has a voice mm -hmm. and, you know, and, and, and our, our likes, our dislikes, you know, our ways of doing things, you know, are respected mm -hmm. and taken into consideration even as you're, you know, planning the support that you want to, want to, you want to provide. Absolutely. And this is a beautiful note to sort of start concluding the discussion. Uh, I mean, everything we've been doing with Maru and, you um, know, in, in, in recent efforts is to change this narrative that, you know, expertise is um, uh, geographically bounded or, you know, uh, the creativity and hard work and work ethic and the ethical reflexivity are everywhere. It really depends on the attitude of the person. Um, I, I, I do want to acknowledge, you know, the, um, the disadvantages that black people and ethnic minority people have faced. But I also think that if we get too stuck in the past, it's very hard to move into the future. Uh, and I know I'm, I'm saying this as, as, a, as a white person in these times, but I also come from Moldova, a, a poor agricultural country, a low income family who migrated to Greece after the collapse of the Soviet Union. You know, I've seen poverty, I've seen socioeconomic inequalities, of course, not to the extent that I've seen in some rural communities I've worked with. Uh, but, you know, um, I, I think as, as sort of an outsider, if that makes sense, but also as someone from a region that would fall under the global south on the basis of uh, scientometrics uh, on, on, uh, in relation to the proportion of uh, how much knowledge we produce, we are sort of similar with African and Latin American countries. Um, and I would say, you know, um, to, to find a way to bridge those differences and, and see a third way of coexistence, right? An alternative way of coexistence. And that's what you're saying, Ifiani. Uh, yeah. Mutual respect and everyone, of, for everyone's value and contribution. Uh, mm. You know, first and foremost, we're all equal at the human level. There's no doubt about that. Uh, mm. Secondly, people have different talents and knowledge uh, and expertise and ideas. Everyone can contribute something. And it's, it's important for us to acknowledge everyone's um, you know, value again and contribution in, in the way that it comes. Mm. So I think for, for, for the Northern partners, and again, now I'm in the UK, I'm part of the, of the Global North. Uh, I think we are responsible of making sure that when these conversations happen, we treat our partners in Africa, Asia, or the Middle East, where we work with, uh, you know, our resource researchers, uh, engage them in the consultations, in the conversations, in the conceptualizations of mm. whatever projects. Uh, because they are resourceful, wise, and experienced uh, mm. in what they do, right? Yeah. Uh, and then we can see how we can combine our knowledge and specializations to to create something that didn't exist before. Mm. Yeah, I, I agree. I know as you're speaking, I just you know I just remembered. So I'm from the Igbo-speaking part of the country oh, in yes. Nigeria, and you know uh, Igbos have all sorts of proverbs. But the one that comes to mind here is that. Your morning begins when you wake up. Oh. <laughs> so, and what that tells me is that it is never too late yeah. to begin to do the right thing. Mm. And that's why for me, I'm also not bogged down by what has happened in the past. Mm. The fact that we've gotten to this level that we're even having discussions about it yeah. is such a huge progress. The fact that we, we are now at a point where, you know, Black Lives Matter is taking root in the U.S., anti-racism mm -hmm. is taking root, you know, globally. Different companies and, you know, corporations in the U.S. are, you know, are beginning to reverse some of the things mm -hmm. they've been doing. It is a huge deal for me. Because what it means is that the global community has woken up and mm -hmm. it's our morning. We cannot be bogged down by what was happening while we were asleep. Now we're awake and we're ready to take it. And... I think discussions like this, like your platform, you know, just helps some people understand because to be honest, some people also do not understand the enormity of what it is that you know, mm -hmm. we're dealing with. Yeah. So what it simply takes is for us to say, okay, let's have, let's have a mutual discussion. Let it be a safe space that people are able to say, you know, how they feel, say the way they think that sh things should move forward. And we come to that understanding because ultimately, like you said, you know, we're all humans, you know, yeah. I mean, we come from different places, different colors and stuff like that. But, but really, you know, for me as an Igbo person, we've woken up and this is our morning and we just need to, you know, keep pushing, having this discussion. 
so that ultimately uh, we're all better for it, you know. Mm -hmm. And I'm, I'm a proponent of, you know, really, let's talk about this thing because if we don't talk about it, you may have a misconception about it, you know, about what you even think that I know or what it is that I'm doing or why, that, why I do those things. But when we have a mutual discussion that is respectful, then we come to a good understanding, then, you know, then we're able to move, you know, humanity forward. Mm -hmm. So, you know, let, let, let the discussion continue, you know, as yeah. far as I'm concerned. Yeah. I, I, I love it. And, and I think of the concept of Ubuntu as, as well, uh, sort of, uh, we exist through each other or that interdependency if I understand the concept well and mm -hmm. and I also you, your ebook proverb uh, reminded me of another proverb I came across once a, a, web, a web proverb which said um, you you can't hold the tree of knowledge on your by, by your own hands or something of the sort I can't remember okay. I might I might I might <laughs> paraphrasing uh, but yeah. it, it you know you knowledge is so vast you yeah. you need to to uh, you need others to really understand mm -hmm. Uh, mm -hmm. life and, and the problems of life. So, so thank you so much. I, I very much appreciate that we came to Proverbs because it's such a cultural heritage in yeah. the African region. Uh, absolutely. Absolutely. <laughs> so I think we need to pay kudos to that. Uh, yeah. Thank you so much, Ifiani. Mm -hmm. I, I, I thought it was so educational. Uh, I'll let you give the final word and then we'll say goodbye to our viewers. Okay, so, so to me, it's, you know, um, this is, I think this is um, this is a movement, you know, you know, whose time has come. Um, mm -hmm. Let's just keep having the discussions, sharing ideas, you know, be respectful of each other, and knowing that ultimately, what the global north wants and what the global south wants is a better world, you know. Uh, mm -hmm. And because you know the global north, in a way, in the global south, in a way, had been asleep all this while, the global north had to step in to make sure that things work. So now we've come to the realization, we've all woken up. Let's keep having that discussion. I'm, I'm, an, I'm an optimist. And I believe that at the rate that we're going, it's, you know, we're, we're all going to be better for it and, and processes will improve. And obviously, you know, for me, as a community health physician, you know, lives will be saved you know, and people are healthy for it. Absolutely. It's at the end of the day, is the human life, uh, yeah. protecting human life. Thank you so much, Ifiani. We hope to see more of you. Uh, looking forward to see more of your work. Keep us Absolutely. updated. I will. I will. <laughs> Be and safe and you. healthy. Yeah, I will. Thank you again for having me. And and and, and, I, and keep in touch. We you know we hope we can continue the conversation in some form. Absolutely. <laughs> Take Thank care. You. Bye, Fiani. All the best. Bye. Bye. Okay.